that people make us very happy. Some in the coming, some in the going. And the thing is about people, when it comes to people, we sometimes, maybe a lot of times, allow Satan to divide us. And then, you know, this can center around different belief systems. It can center around personalities or prejudices or a number of things. But it is alarming how divisive the body of Christ is and how we pick sides and we throw rocks at each other. And in that, uh, we get the title of the message this morning in looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Because in our dealings with folk, we are either a blessing or a burden. And Paul is going to lay out three principles in this chapter I hope that we can grasp because Satan would like nothing better than to come in and divide and isolate and separate and get us arguing with each other and not accepting each other and not forgiving each other. And then when he's done that, he has won a tremendous victory in the body of Christ. And it is alarming to see how quickly we fall into that pattern of judging, of criticizing, of condemning, of not accepting one another and our differences. You know, we can talk theology all day long. And I'm sure if you and I were to sit down over a cup of coffee, it wouldn't be long before we come across a topic that we're going to have differing opinions on. And that's okay. It's okay to have different opinions. But when they begin to isolate us and separate us and divide us and get us angry at each other, you know, we're losing the battle because, folks, we're all going to be in heaven together. I mean, those of us that believe that Jesus alone is sufficient for our salvation, we're going to be in heaven for eternity. And it would seem to me that we could learn to get along here, seeing that we will be with him forever. So what we want to do in this chapter uh, is learn how you and I can resist the attacks and temptations of Satan and learn to be a blessing instead of a burden when it comes to dealing with people, even though we may have differences. Uh, and if you don't believe we have differences, we could talk about football and the game that was yesterday. And there's going to be a lot of differences in this room about how that football game was played yesterday. But, you know, the whole thing is let's learn to love one another. In fact, that's principle number one. You'll find it in verses one through four. The first key is learning to love. I mean, think about this. Jesus gave us one defining factor that would let people know we're followers of his. And what is that one determining factor that Jesus told his disciples would differentiate us as followers of him? That we love one another. By, Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And so verses 1 through 4 of this chapter, Paul's going to talk to us about the, the, the key of love. He says, but I have determined within myself that I would not come to you again in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Now Paul is obviously talking about the letter that he had written to the Corinthians in many respects, with hard things to say to them. They had, for whatever reason, uh, a lot of issues in the church at Corinth, one of which is they were polarized around personalities. 
Because some were followers of Apollos, and some were followers of Peter, and some were followers of Paul. And then the spiritual people said, we just follow Christ. We don't pay attention to any man. And so he wrote to them a very hard letter, talking to them about their issues and about their problems. And now Paul is saying, and I love the way he starts verse 1 of chapter 2, understanding that there were still issues that were going on at Corinth. In fact, there were a lot of folks at Corinth who just did not like Paul. They thought he was not an apostle. They thought he was harsh in the way that he dealt with people. Uh, they didn't think he had much personality. He wasn't pleasant to look at. And so they had lots of issues with Paul. And he trying to correct some of those, he says, I determined within myself that I should not come to you again in sorrow. Another translation says, come in heaviness. Paul determined within himself that he did not want to visit the Corinthians with a heavy heart. He had to make a decision deep down. I have determined within myself. Sometimes we just need to make up our minds that we're going to act in a certain way before we ever get to the situation in which we're going to act. Paul says, I have determined within myself that when I get to you guys, I don't want to get there with heaviness and with sorrow. And sometimes you and I just need to learn to encourage ourselves. In fact, Paul did this very same thing when he talked about going to Corinth for the very first time. Remember, he says, I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and Him crucified. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Paul says, I've made up my mind that when I get there, the only thing I'm going to do when I get there is preach Christ. And now he is saying, I have determined within myself that when I come again, I'm not going to come in heaviness or in sorrow. And, and so there's this self-encouragement that he uh, is talking about. And, and just think about it. He, he sort of tells them why in verse 2. I don't want to come to you guys bearing a big stick. I don't want to come to you guys being heavy-handed, or I don't want to come to you guys, you know, in, in a way that's going to produce sorrow in you when I come. And the reason he says that is verse 2, because if I come to you in sorrow and heaviness, then who's going to make me glad if I'm the one making you sad? Does that make sense? He's kind of asking, asking a question there in verse 2. If we go around bringing sorrow and heaviness, then who is the one that's going to encourage us is the point he's making there in verse 2. So when he says that when I came to you, he said, I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow uh, over those for, from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you, that my joy is the joy of you all. So Paul is kind of setting the stage now that uh, even though sometimes correction and rebuke are necessary uh, and sometimes there are things that need to be dealt with, there's always a right way to deal with that so that we don't make people come to the point where they are angry with God and mad at everybody else. And that's what Paul is saying here. I came to you, he said, uh, I wrote to you this very thing, that when I come to you, I should have sorrow over those for whom I ought to have joy. They, they were Paul's crown and joy because he brought them to the Lord. Now he's saying that, that even though correction and, and rebuke are necessary, Paul wants them to be aware of how that correction and, and rebuke was presented. And you see that in verse 4. Uh, because when Paul says, I came to you, I wrote to you, out of much anguish and affliction of heart, I wrote to you with many tears that you should not be grieved, that you might know the love which I have uh, so abundantly for you all. When there is a need to correct, and there is a need to point out the wrong in somebody else's life, how should we do that? Well, verse 4 says we should do it 
uh, with tears and anguish and affliction. The Corinthians got mad at Paul when he tried to do that because they thought he was being harsh. And what the Lord is teaching you and me is that when that comes, we should not be like the Corinthians and get angry and upset about it. Think about that for just a minute, particularly those of you that are married. What happens when your spouse begins to say something that is of a corrective nature to you? How do you respond to that? If in the body of Christ someone says something to you of a corrective nature, how do you do it? How do you respond to it? Most of us say, who gives you the right to tell me what I should be doing or how I should live? And we need to be careful that we hear the tone in which correction and rebuke should take place. Uh, the key to any kind of corrective action, Paul says, should be in a spirit of love. He says, you know how much I abundantly love you guys. Now, I may be wrong on this point, but I think one of the reasons we like to correct people so much is it makes us feel a little bit better. I'm not quite that bad, so let me tell you what you're doing wrong, and, I, and we kind of compare ourselves with each other. And as we brought out the last couple of weeks, you know, sometimes people think correction and rebuke are a gift of the Spirit, and they look at you like, okay, you're not spiritual. You're listening to the wrong kind of music. You're going to the wrong kind of shows. You're wearing the wrong kind of clothes, and we point our finger at them, and there's not the anguish of heart and, and the bitterness in our own heart when we point that out to somebody else, which is what Paul is saying here. I want you guys to remember the way I approached you. He said it was with anguish and affliction and with many tears. And I think before we begin to point out the faults in somebody else, we ought to make sure our hearts are right before the Lord and we do it in such a way that it's not going to generate condemnation to the person that hears it but let them know that we are loving and kind. So do we really demonstrate that we have love to people when we are correcting them or dealing with them? Do they know that we love them? The people that you are approaching, think about how the Father deals with you. Now, is the Father harsh with us? Is the Father angry with us when he corrects us? And without giving me an answer to this, you guys know your Bible, and you know the story in Genesis chapter 3, right? The story of Genesis chapter 3 is the, the temptation and the fall of man. They eat of the tree that God commanded them not to eat of. And Genesis 3 goes on to say, that the Lord, in the cool of the day, began to cry, call out to Adam, Adam, where are you? Now, what you don't see when you read that is the tone in which God asked that question. How do you picture the father asking Adam that question in Genesis chapter 3? Is it the voice of an arresting officer? Adam, where are you? Is it the cry of an angry father whose child has rebelled and disobeyed? We don't catch the tone of that. And oftentimes when you and I read the scriptures or we hear God speaking to us, we're missing the tone in which God speaks to us. You know what? God loves you. You're his child. And when God speaks to you, it is not in a condemning way. In fact, it's the prophet Ezekiel, you know, who says, Turn ye, turn ye, why will you die in your sin? For the Lord has no delight in the death of the wicked. And so Paul is saying, when I wrote to you guys, it wasn't with a heavy hand so I could straighten you out. You're a bunch of rebels over there, and you're living wrong, and you're doing the wrong thing, and you need to get your act together. He didn't write that way. He wrote with affliction and anguish of heart and much tears because that's the way the Father deals with you and me. But 
It is, it is heartbreaking, I think, to the Father when we begin to approach other people and we begin to say, why can't you get your act together? What's wrong with you, man? Why are you always messing up? Why are you always stumbling? Where's the anguish in our heart? We're sort of like the guy that Jesus told the parable about who owed his master millions of dollars. And the master came to him and says, pay what you owe or be thrown in jail. And the parable goes on to say that the man fell down at his master's feet and said, have mercy on me. I will repay it all. And his master had compassion and pity on him and, had, and said, okay, I forgive you of the debt. He left out of that audience with his master, found a fellow co-worker that owed him a thousand bucks and grabbed him by the shirt collar and says, pay me your money that you owe me or I'll throw you in prison. And the guy fell down and begged him and says, I'll pay you back. Just give me a chance. I'll pay you every penny. And the, and the guy had no mercy on him and had him thrown in jail. And then his other co-workers went to the master and said, let me just tell you what happened. And the master came back to him and says, you wicked and evil servant. I forgave you simply because you asked me to. You should have at least done the same to the one who asked mercy from you. Now, guess what? You're going to jail. And you won't come out till you've paid every penny. And so I think when we deal with people, the key has to be love. And the people know that we love them when we are dealing with them. When it comes to the differences that we have, uh, whatever it may be that is dividing us, when we approach them about that, are we doing it in a spirit of love and meekness and gentleness, not trying to lord it over somebody else and say it's going to be my way or the highway? You do it this way or else you're out. You know, and I think a lot of times that's what we see in the church is we see this heavy-handed, judgmental spirit against other people because they disagree with our position and don't see it the same way we see it. And we get heavy-handed and we're missing verse 4. We're missing the attitude of love. We're missing the broken heart that we should have when our brother or sister is offending us or we are offending them. And so if we're going to learn not to let Satan divide us, then the key has to be love. Everything that we do when it comes to other people should have the motive of love, even if it needs to be corrected. If I'm living in sin, then come tell me about it. But do it in a spirit of love with the goal of restoration uh, as, as the end result. You know that, and Paul says, you guys know how heavy my heart was when I had to write to you and let you know. But I want you to know the love which I have so abundantly for you. And I believe in the body of Christ that above everything else, people should know that we love them. How, whatever the, 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 the disagreement are. And you guys here at Calvary Chapel do a great job of that. You know, one of the things the Lord really showed me a long time ago is I want to be a church like the Thessalonians. And you, you know the Thessalonians, Paul says, everywhere I go, people speak about your love there. You guys love each other there in Thessal Thessalonica. You know, and, and, and really, that's what Jesus did for us. He loved us. So the first key is love. Second key, verses 5 through 11, is learning to forgive and, and comfort people. But if anyone has caused grief, verse 5, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment which was afflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that you might put to the test, uh, put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. 
Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one, of your, uh, that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Paul now is talking about, in dealing with the sin and failure, probably of the man he mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the man who was living in sexual immorality, who was living in an illicit relationship with his father's wife. Paul says, you guys need to deal with that in Corinth. And he wrote them a heavy letter and says, you guys need to deal with the sin that's in the church there. I've already judged such a man. And so apparently the church listened to Paul. And this man was confronted because of his sin. Now, as we went through 1 Corinthians, we, we told you when we got to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that those guys prided themselves on their tolerance. They, well, everybody's welcome here. And, and in a sense, that's right. But what they were doing was knowing someone living in open sin failed to confront that man because of his sin. And Paul wrote them and says, you guys need to deal with sin. Don't you know that a little leaven will leaven the whole lump? So he encourages them to deal with the sin. But now, apparently, this man has repented. And the church is unwilling to forgive him. And so that's why he starts off with the admonition in verse 5. He says, guys, learn not to be too severe. I want you guys to learn to forgive and to comfort this. The church was unwilling to forgive this guy. And I started thinking about that. How many times in the church is that story repeated year in and year out? That someone gets caught up in sin and the church stands back with their arms folded and, and the person repents and they're sorry for their sin and the church says, I'm, yeah, you, you made your bed, sleep in it. And we take this hard stand against people who have stumbled and fallen uh, and the church, really, Christianity is the only place where the wounded are buried instead of nurtured back to help. You know, we bury our own wounded. And all of us struggle with sin. You know, it's, it's not just something that's isolated to one or two people. And, and when sin is confronted, the goal is to be restoration. Restoration to the Father and restoration in the body. Yet the church at Corinth had taken a hard stand and they had said, you know, this guy blew it, he sinned, and we're not taking him back in. And Paul now has to encourage them that, verse 7, they ought to forgive and they ought to comfort him. Because he said, and I hope you catch what happens in verse 7, because I, I see this repeated over and over again. I know people today, and maybe you do too, who say something like this, I will never step foot in a church again. Because somebody has said something to them or done something to them that they have been deeply offended about. And they may have had a change of attitude and heart, but they said, I'll never go back to church again. And I know people right now that are like that because someone has said something to them about a sin or a practice or a lifestyle. And, and maybe rightly so, but it wasn't done in a spirit of love or a spirit of humility. And those folks are offended. And when the church fails to forgive, what does he say happens in verse 7? And I hope you catch this. What happens to the person whom, to whom the church fails to extend forgiveness and comfort. Verse 7 says they get swallowed up with much sorrow. They get to the place where they just their life is just overwhelmed and they say, what's the use? You know, if I can't, if things aren't going to be right, they get swallowed up even after they have repented. It leads to a person being swallowed up with sorrow. They'll beat themselves up. Why did I ever do that? You know, and 
And really, honestly, guys, this is the place that we should be able to come and not beat ourselves up. Because if I were to ask you, how many of you have had failures in the past, all of us would probably raise our hand. And if those things were known to everybody in the, in the church, they would say, I can't believe they, did, they ever did that. You know, one of the things that amazes me, and you guys, some of you guys are missing out because you don't come on Wednesday night. I'm just telling you, you're missing out. Because we, you know, we're hearing testimonies of people, and we've heard you know, 30 or 40 testimonies now on Wednesday night of how people have come to know the Lord. And what always amazes me after I hear somebody's testimony, and they talk a little bit about their life before they met Christ, I just kind of look at them and say, I never would have imagined that in your life. I, I just can't see that because now you know, you're a completely different person. But yet sometimes in the church we'll hold somebody's past over their head to the point where they get swallowed up in sorrow. And this ought to be the place that we can come and let our hair down and be open with each other and honest with each other and say and go up to somebody and say, will you, will you pray for me? I am really struggling here, and this is, this is overwhelming me. I need somebody to stand with me and encourage me and support me and pray for me as I go through this. But what happens when somebody comes and does that to us, we stand back and say, why can't you get it together? What's wrong with you? Why do you always struggle with that? Why can't you get your life together? And we judge, and the person just gets swallowed up in sorrow, and they say, yeah, you're right, I, I'm just a miserable person. I'll never get, amount to anything. And Paul says, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort. This ought to be the place where I come in. And as I share my life with people, and, and I, get, I get tickled or amused at all these we, we small group terminology things that we, we use, we're going to share life together. And I think that's a wonderful goal that we share life together. But to me, sharing life together, when I come and I'm having struggles and difficulties, I know that I am loved and accepted in the beloved, and I can share that. And somebody's going to stand with me and say, you know, I'm going to pray with you, and we're going to see victory in this. And God's going to give you the ability to overcome, and I'm here beside you till we get to that goal. And we need to lock arms with each other. And we need to pray with each other. And we need to support each other. And we need to forgive each other. And we need to comfort each other. That's what the body's all about. It, this ought to be a safe place. It ought to be a place that we can come and be encouraged. Which brings me to goal number three in my favorite. The key is love. We've got to love each other. The Lord loves us. And he says, that's the one thing people will know you're my disciples by, is your willingness to love one another. And then you've got to learn to forgive and comfort each other. Because if you don't, that is like giving place to Satan. And if you really are interested in, in this, verse 11, he says, we're not ignorant of the devices of Satan. You know, Satan comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Satan would like nothing better this morning than to separate us so that he can isolate us and then dominate us. And that's what happens in the body of Christ. Satan will come in and put a wedge between two people or a group of people or a congregation or this church and that church. He'll put a wedge between them. And all of a sudden there's a separation and there's an isolation. And eventually it leads to domination. And it shouldn't be in the body of Christ. Let love be the key. Learn to comfort and forgive, he says, because we're not ignorant of his devices. He wants to divide. He wants to conquer. And he wants to destroy. And all this is in the context of forgiving and comforting people who have fallen. And I think Satan's had a heyday in the church, by the way. Which leads us to go to, to principle number three in this chapter. My favorite of the three. The key is love. I've got to learn to forgive and comfort. But there's victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. Verses 12 through uh, 17 will take us to the end of the chapter. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, 
I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Paul was in a place where there was a great opportunity for him to preach, a wide open door for him to preach the gospel. Yet he was so concerned about Titus that he left this place of fruitful ministry to find Titus. Now, why was Saul, Paul so interested in finding Titus? Because Titus was the one bringing him word from Corinth after he wrote the letter. And he was grieving for these people because, I don't know what's going on with the Corinthians. I don't know what's going on with Titus. And so it caused him to leave this open door. I had no rest in my spirit. And really, that ought to be the way it is with us when there's conflict between brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, that there should not be rest until we get it resolved, or at least make an attempt to get it resolved. But he says, I had no rest in my spirit. This great opportunity to preach, I left so I could find Titus and get news of Corinth and what was going on there. Now... Thanks be to God. And it's always amazing to me how Paul writes things like this when he's in the midst of a heavy heart and a deep trial. Uh, Paul was an amazing man. I look forward to meeting him one day, but here he is, you know, in the midst of heaviness and a, a heart that was about to break because of his love for the Corinthians and not knowing what was going on with them and wanting them to be in a place of restoration. He says, thanks be to God. And I think the reason Paul said that is not because of the trial that he was in, but what those trials tended to reveal about what was in his own heart. And you know what? I think that's why you and I can thank God in our trials. Not because we're having a hard time and life is tough and, and the situations are difficult, I think God's teaching that to us uh, individually and, and corporately here at the church. We've just gone through uh, at, at the church a series of, of what appears to be one setback after another. You know, and, and we stand back and we look at that and say, okay, can we thank God in the midst of that? Uh, or, or is it just showing the content of what's really in our heart? Are we really learning to trust the Lord. And just for your information, if you don't know what we're talking about, yeah, I've shared with you, you know, all the situations we've had with the fire alarm and, you know, now that we're safe after spending a, an enormous amount of money to get the fire alarm system fixed and repaired. Well, this Friday, you know, when I was at, in Aiken, I get a text. You know, at first, the, the first text that came in says, the ceiling has fallen in at the church. And I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Do I need to get in my car and come back from Aiken? You know, and then, then uh, get another text. Well, it's not just it's, the ceiling hasn't fallen. It's just caved in at a certain part. Well, the, the, the ceiling did cave in, in the back. And guess where it caved in? Over the fire alarm system that we just spent all this money fixing. And when it caved in, all of the water from the ceiling that dropped, guess where it landed? In our freshly new fire alarm system. You know, so I'm saying, okay, Lord, <laughs> what is it you're trying to show us? <laughs> you, know, cause I, you know, maybe I'm over analytical and I think too much, and maybe I don't. I said, well, you know, the ceiling is the owner's responsibility. But I can hear him now when he says, don't you have insurance on the building? And I'm saying, yeah, we do. But it's got a $1,000 deductible on the policy. <laughs> you know, so what does the Lord teach you? I, I need to be like Paul and say, thanks be to God. Because do I thank God that my ceiling fell in? And when I got here yesterday, I went back and looked at the ceiling. And also went back and looked at it on this side. And I said, we're going to have the same problem over here because the ceiling's already dropped down on this side over here, you know, in the back. 
So for, for those of you who don't know, this is just a glorified storage space back here, except for the prayer room over here. You know, so when in the midst of my trial, in the heaviness of heart, I need to be able to say, thanks be unto God. And he tells us why in the last part of that verse. Who always causes us to triumph in Jesus. One of the first songs that I learned in church when I got saved was a song called Victory in Jesus. In fact, I just want to bless you guys. We're going to watch the video of this song this morning. So if y'all go ahead, get the lights. All right, we're going to celebrate. You know this old hymn. Let's sing it. Come on, let's lift it up. Here we go. Sing it out. Here we go. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him. And all my love is to him. He punched me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Come on, everybody. Put your hands together.
thankful for victory. Love that song. I learned that song 35 years ago, and I still know all the verses to it. And I find myself a lot of times singing that song because instead of learning to lash out and respond, when I go through trials and difficulties, it is not because God's love is grown cold toward me. It is to reveal what really is in my heart. You know, when I'm squeezed, what comes out? And that's what I want to come out when I'm squeezed. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's in, in sin when I can't seem to get victory. It's in trials when life seems to be hard. It is when people are you know, not getting along. We need to follow our Lord uh, in victory uh, and just break out in that song, Victory in Jesus. I'll tell you what, triumph. Our king will always lead us to victory. And I think one of the things that if we're going to learn to be a burden or a blessing is that we've got to learn to follow our leader as he leads us into victory and triumph. And Jesus you know, a, a bruised flax or a smoke, a bruised reed or a smoking flax, he would not quench, as the Bible says. And so, verse 14, he always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now, I, I started to write some things in my notes here that I said, maybe I ought to change that around a little bit. Uh, and just say it in a nicer way. Let me just say it in a nicer way. Wherever you and I go, we are leaving an odor, a fragrance. We're leaving a fragrance of life or we're leaving a fragrance of death. We're a blessing or we're a burden. And what kind of odor are you leaving in the places that you go? Is, is it the fragrance of Christ? Is it the aroma of life? that he talks about here. And the only place we're going to get that is as when we follow our leader into victory. Now, you've got to picture in your mind what's, what, where Paul's getting this analogy from, this aroma of life, an aroma of death. When a Roman uh, legion would conquer an area for the Roman Empire, and it was more than 5,000 people, then they would march through the cities of Rome waving the incense. And uh, the incense was the aroma of life to the people who had won the victory. It was the aroma of death to those captives that were following the army because they were headed right to the arena where they would be fighting with wild animals. You know, so this triumphal march was either an aroma of life or an aroma of death. And Paul is saying that our triumph is in Christ. We follow him. And I want to do what Christ has done. And that is diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For verse 15 says, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To, the, to one we are the aroma of death, uh, leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life, leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many peddling the word of God, but out of sincerity as from God, we speak in the light of God in Christ. Paul is saying, and I hope what you catch here, uh, you catch what he's saying here, we're following our king, He's leading us into victory. Thanks be unto God. And all this, by the way, is in the context of loving and comforting and forgiving. And he says, we're following our king. He's leading us to victory. We're the aroma of life. We're not the aroma of death. And we're not like many out there who are peddling the word of God. Now, what he means by that is there's people out there who have their own 
axes to grind and their own agendas to build. And he says, we're not like that. And there are people in the church like that. They have their own agenda. They have their axe to grind. And they use that as an opportunity for whatever. You know, and many times it is taking advantage of people. But he says, we do it in sincerity because we do it in the sight of God and in Christ. So Paul realized that everything he did was under the watchful eye of the king. And we need to be aware that everything we do is under the watchful eye of our king. You know, so whether it's opening our Bible uh, in a private devotion, leading our family, or in public worship, it's all in the watchful eye of our king. And we want to do that in such a way that we are spreading the aroma of life, of life. So there's victory in Jesus, but only when we follow the king. Some of you th this morning need to make a decision to, to follow the king to victory. Maybe there's some issues going on in your life that you're wrestling and struggling with, and, and you just, you're, you're, you're at a place where you, you, you need some victory in Jesus. We're going to stand, we're going to pray. The worship team's going to come and lead us in one last song this morning. And all I'm asking you to do as we worship on this last song is whatever it is in your life this morning that you need victory in following the King as we worship, lift it up to Him. Father, I thank you that you love us and that you have, have given us life through Jesus. And Lord, I pray that as we follow our leader, that we follow in love, that we forgive and comfort those that are around us, always looking to our King, keeping our eyes on Jesus that we might spread his fragrance wherever we go. Thank you, Father, for, for speaking to us. We bear our hearts before you now and ask God that in this, this moment while we worship, that each one of us might do business with you and things might be made right with you. Lord, we know that you both hear and answer our prayer. So receive our worship, hear our cry. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.